so we continue the discussion and we have three short contributions all on the imperial mode of living and the global south. First, we have Stefan Schmalz for 20 minutes until 10 to 5. Then we have Ngailin Sum until 10 past 5. And then Sabrina Fernandez until half past 5. And then we have time for discussion. Stefan, please burn loose, as they say in Dutch. Um, originally, it was planned that I will give a brief comment on um, on a um, on a uh, presentation on IMO and the Global South, and unfortunately, the speaker couldn't come, and we rearranged it a little bit. So I've prepared something myself, something little. Um, um, just a few points which are more or less connected with the first part and some overall thoughts uh, on the book. Um, I firstly have to use the PowerPoint to share it. Just a second, please. It's very brief. This. Do you see it? Yes, it works. Okay, great. So um, I, I just thought um, I read um, Marcel's paper and um, yeah, I had some thoughts and also on the book and I just thought about like raising three questions on the IMO. It's a very nice approbation in English. It sounds a little bit like an iPod or an iPhone, IMO. Um, and the global south. So I, I just will go straight forward and put these, yeah, raise these questions, make three points which might be interesting to discuss. And that's basically my contribution. So, um, firstly, uh, regarding the question IMO and, and the global south, I would like to link back to something Marcus said before. Uh, actually, what IML might be in the global south. So to discuss a little bit, like several countries which have larger middle classes and what this concept might mean for um, the global south as such. Second uh, question or point I want to make is on the politics of growth, um, to talk about growth, GDP growth, growth alliances in the global south, which to my sense, yeah, from a political perspective, are very uh, important and raise a lot of questions, issues such as political strategy. And as in many papers, um, your paper, Marcel, and also uh, the paper Uli and Marcos distributed, the notion on unequal exchange is playing an important role. I just that's a little bit going away from history. So I'm no historian, I'm interested in history, but I'm not a historian, any, but uh, like raising one more conceptual point. So um, I know in the global south, who and where? Um, so I thought a little bit, I think uh, Nora already brought this topic in, um, the issue of uh, north-south relations. I think um, if, one reads uh, the book of Marcus and Oli. Uh, there's the story that, okay, the uh, mode of living is uh, rooted somehow in colonialism, imperialism, uh, and Fordism, uh, the age of mass consumptions getting more and more important, getting new dynamic, further parts of the working class get integrated. Um, and it also, and that's one major point, uh, it gets globalized, so spreads to different countries and uh, also to uh, the global south. And it's leading to contradictions. I remember what Marcus said today, eco-imperialism, a new competition about things, uh, resources, agricultural land, and so forth. So um, very important point, I think, which needs... Uh, some more thoughts on this north-south relation as such. And uh, yeah, um, so my, my, my question, basically, it's a very broad category, global south, north-south relations. Um, and uh, so I would like to bring some points, uh, think a little about, a bit about what uh, the imperial mode of living might mean uh, for the so-called middle classes, uh, 
in the global south. And I want to come back to a debate in the 70s, 80s, mainly inspired by world system theory about the hierarchy um, of the capitalist world system. Um, so uh, the very well-known three soul model with the core semi-periphery periphery, very often it's received as kind of static, but um, there have been a lot of debates uh, during this time on this uh, concept, which might be very helpful to, to shed some light on the issue of imperial mode of living global south. So the question, which countries belong where? Is India part of the periphery or semi-periphery because it's so big? Criteria, so very good uh, um, graph is from uh, this one, which shows a little bit that it's not just like one country belongs somewhere, but there's a different mix of activities, core-like activities in the periphery uh, do also exist there a little. And one could um, say, okay, um, this has certainly implications. There have been implications how wage labor looks like in these different zones and if there are any changes. But I guess that uh, the specific position in such a zone of the capitalist world system also influences uh, how the imperial mode or how many persons or which groups are somehow embedded. Um, on the one hand, um, there, there's been one interesting debate about like wealth um, during this time. Um, uh, Arigi once told these debates like non-debates because they were like sound of strange sometimes, very um, specific, a little bit nerdy. Um, so uh, that the role, um, that there are different forms of wealth, which are, and that's very inspiring. Um, there's this term in world system studies of oligarchic wealth, um, that not everybody, everyone, um, has this uh, wealth available, direct relation to the intensity and efficiency of its efforts. And this oligarchic wealth is like mainly based in the core countries. Um, one could say uh, at in the semi-periphery, like countries such as Brazil, for instance, there are very often struggles about uh, somehow increasing the wealth of larger groups, uh, groups or struggles also about the relationship um, and struggles about um, well, how to get included or, um, or contesting the relationship of which has to do with oligarchic wealth, like a very interesting term. So what, uh, what is also very important is consumption. So um, uh, there have been studies on, um, on uh, of course, on wage labors, so so that, for instance, wage labor is much more common, um, common form, uh, regulate wage labor in the core countries. But uh, uh, also consumption is an if issue on uh, of dependency theories and so forth. And I think um, one major question for all studies on the pure mode of living and like the form, what kind of forms of whether, um, I don't know, rising middle classes, upper classes, the ruling class, which certainly in the global South countries also have some, adopted some of these forms. So where does, does this uh, um, uh, mode of living is, is exactly starting? So for instance, you will have large middle class in Latin in America, they won't have um, a car, they won't own a house, uh, but the big distinction is to command employees, domestic work, female employees. So um, I think um, if you look at this debate, it might be very interesting to depict a bit more who exploits whom, who is part uh, of which class and has access to um, uh, forms of uh, oligarchic wealth. So to have a more differentiated picture or, um, of, of, of this notion, because I think, um, yeah, it's a big question. I don't know how the discussion looks like, how and how far is world regions. And I think Marcel's right, we need more data, like maybe it's a time for a comparative project with household surveys historically, how over specific consumption of products is spreading. 
other parts of the world. Second point, uh, which is connected to the first uh, point. I think um, if we look in particular at um, semi-periphery and some countries of the periphery, um, uh, one uh, can say that in many cases, um, yeah, uh, hegemony was uh, also in times of Fordism, global Fordism, um, exerted through successful growth alliances, including at least parts of the working classes, maybe some, some of them also doing some progressive politics, um, providing growth and with growth also consumption. I think the best case is China, just this quote on consumption level in China and pre Maoist uh, China, consumption of 0, 0. 0.8 kilogram of tea a year, uh, new footwear in five years. Of course, uh, politics, um, uh, which some, uh, were some sort of form, uh, some sort of uh, being hegemonic, uh, very often um, had a lot to do with providing growth and consumption. And there have been also progressive struggles uh, about uh, access to consumption. The, the different pathways, definitely one could say, um, uh, let's stay with China. Um, China as an example, which would grow very fast and also provided uh, consumption goods to large parts of the population at some more um, numbers. In 1978, they have been produced 200 fans, ventilators in China. In 1992, 240,000 and then 20 million something. So this, this was definitely changing. The whole model, the whole Chinese model is uh, mainly based on something one can call GDPism, and it's based on output legitimacy somehow. So uh, uh, consumption-driven development models, um, system which is somehow also at least meritocratic, uh, can um, get into the party, have an exam, um, get elevated, climb up the ladder. And there are certain similarities in East Asia with the developmental state. Uh, development, which was mainly possible due to stable hegemonic blocks, growth alliances, and also the specific insertion of these countries in the US world order, um, uh, Cold War. Um, and I think this, this has been something also like a breeding ground for uh, Easternized uh, adoptions of IMO. Don't know if there's any work on this already. If you look at other world regions, the picture is different. So uh, Brazil and Latin America did not work in the same way. Very often there have been political struggles over development, even over <laughs> for mass consumption. So that very often in these countries, mass movements uh, who try to bring in the working class, there have been struggles about the economic uh, model, uh, less stability, very often it went back and forth, take Argentina with Peron. Okay, you can now discuss whether Peron was progressive or not, but any, somehow uh, the mass, uh, you know, urban masses were integrated through its policy, uh, in policies. Um, and then it was military coup. Uh, he was back. Um, then uh, later on, liberalization with Menem and Kirchner back forth, back forth, back forth. So um, I think um, it's important for progressive policy this question of how to, to cope with this situation, struggles, uh, which very often led to IMOL. Um, and well, today there's this extractivism debate, I guess one of the other speakers will refer to it. And, for me, a big question is to which model uh, one today should refer progressive politics, uh, Cuba, Mao, Zapatistas, whatever, because I guess this uh, forms of, of, of models are not viable, not the ones we, uh, we certainly are searching for. Last but not least, very short, I think I'm, I'm out of, running out of time. Um, uh, unequal exchange, the final point. Just very simple. There's also a lot to do, um, work to do on unequal exchange. Uh, we're always like the assumption is, of course, 
the global South gets employ, exploited and so forth. But if you look, for instance, at trade ties, Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa, for instance, Germany, it's not that high. So uh, I think not all the wealth of, is coming from these countries. Of course, um, there are um, um, well, at least many people would argue this way. Um, and I think uh, all the discussion about the unequal exchange, um, well, it has a lot to do with uh, looking at hidden costs, at hidden problems, um, also like a critique of ideology. I think uh, Uli and Markus did a great job in referring to more use value related um, um, forms of argumentation. So. Um, commodity production, agricultural uh, goods, take for instance cocoa with its high ecological burden, water usage. So looking at material flows, that's a strength. And um, as uh, um, um, uh, the point today, oops, sorry, made, well, went away. Okay, that's, that's now. Uh, a little. Um, um, Marcel's point on, of course, with the new form of um, industrial, um, uh, new division of labor, which is mainly based on industrial goods, one can argue, of course, there are more workers and a lot of value is captured in global value chains. But I think um, there needs a little bit more thought about exactly uh, what exact uh, how the unequal exchange look uh, looks like so for me one per, uh, problem which is very often forgotten in this debate is that the export side so that one important point is that the western countries or most um, countries us um, and uh, europe with its policy are hindering any possibility of a development alternative development path and like exporting, like um, uh, ramping down um, uh, every trade barrier and so forth. So um, I think there is another point which, which could be discussed. So these have been just three questions I wanted to raise. So uh, maybe um, it's helpful and I'm happy to discuss with you. So that's all from my side. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, I think you can be sure that these are helpful points for the discussion. Uh, we continue with Ngai Ling, uh, another 20 minutes. So, well, like Stefan, I've been, I've been first of all asked to comment on a paper and now it turned into a sort of presentation. So what I'm going to do is uh, talking about the IMO and the dialectics of the global South, especially the case of China, which I'm going to use most. So my short presentation is divided into four parts. First of all, about the book. The second part is some kind of a theoretical issue on the so-called hegemonic self and the aspirational global self, okay? I'm going to raise some theoretical issue. And third part is to focus on not only tendency, but some counter tendency. In other words, it's the dialectics of the global self, especially the case of China. In the case of China, I'm going to raise three dialectics. The first one, inequality and the rise of nationalism since 2008 financial crisis. The second dialectic I'm going to raise is, is what in China now called involutionary inf motor growth. And I use a small I, okay, for my I more. And the third part is Another kind of dialectics, which is the futuring of empire. And then I will conclude with some remarks. Let me start with the book. The book, it is an interesting political book that link production consumption between North and South via a mix of critical political ecology, the regulation approach, and the hegemony theory. On the production side, it examined the working and living condition of the workers. Okay, sorry, it examined the working and living condition of the global, but at the same time, with a different form of resource extraction, industrialism, production, and they are largely geared towards the global north. On the consumption side, it highlights the relationship between post-Fordism. Okay, in the global south, 
will they focus on imperial mode of living? Okay, hypothesizing that the global south, there's some kind of attractive attractiveness of the global north, aspirational and even universal, okay, of the global south, especially its elite and its middle classes. Now, the issue is, I would like to raise, first of all, a theoretical issue. Among many arguments in the book and qualification put forward by the author, they put forward that population in the South aspire itself to participate in the convenience of imperial mode of living. This is seen in terms of the IMO being hegemonic. Hegemonic, okay, from the capitalist center and its unbroken attraction for many people in the global South. Let me emphasize the unbroken attraction, okay? Later on, I'm going to raise some dialectics, okay? In when this is the mode of the IMO is transferred somewhere else. Does this idea of aspirational global self reinvent modernization theory via adopting a so-called Marxist Gramscian inspired account? In other words, okay, is it more Parsonian, okay? When one is using ideas such as attraction, aspiration and diffusion, because they are more not, not really that much tied to Gramscian's sort of hegemony theory. They are more, more in terms of Parsonian or even modernization in orientation. So what I'm trying to argue is a Gramscian inspired account would need to open up the black box of hegemony. In other words, hegemony is not just simply there one has to open up the black box of hegemony beyond just simply stating that it is related to attractive common sense subjectivity. A serious account need to open the hegemonization and subjectivization processes. And in our book on cultural political economy, we discuss hegemony as a process and subjectivization as a process that one need to examine what are the ensemble of hegemony apparatuses and the expertise, such as the organic intellectual in the North and South, that make and, if you like, even not make, but sediment the IMO in the global South? In other words, okay, what are the hegemonic apparatus? If this is indeed hegemonic, what are the discursive technology that translate, okay, and negotiate this norm? in the different Southern contexts. So that was my first theoretical question. My second set of question is, well, if we look at hegemony or hegemonization and subjectification as processes, then they are very complex processes. They are very complex dialectical processes. It's not just simply tendency, but counter tendency. So, in other words, okay, they are very complex dialectical processes that need to be recontextualized and not just universalized differently in diverse self and context. And the ideal type hegemony can never really, really fully attained. If you go back to Gramsci, okay, Gramsci's idea of hegemony is always negotiated, never fully attempt, and this is why this uh, keep on this kind of passive revolution, et cetera, et cetera. And based on this theoretical way of thinking about it, this lead me to my next section, and that is a focus on the dialectics, the dialectics of the global South. Well, on the dialectics of global South, I have to locate it somewhere. So I locate it in the case of China. Of course, dialectics, okay, focuses on tendency and condescendency in the recontextualization of the IMO to the global South. The author in the book described mainly by using literature, okay, when they talk about China, they describe, okay, it by using the literature mainly from early post WTO 2001 period of its industrialism as a global factory in terms of low wage accumulation. So, of course, during that stage, the very early stage, okay, 
when it was experiencing, obviously, other counter tendency, the counter tendency of proletarianization, the material emulation of the middle classes, okay, and possibly even IMO, okay, to push it and increase the an increase in environmental degradation. But the point is, China is a lot more complicated than that, especially since the 2008 financial crisis. China also gone through or going through, okay, finance-led capitalism and not just simply production. So China is more complicated, especially since the 2008 financial crisis. And here, I would, as I've said, would like to focus on three dialectical entanglement since the 2008. First of all, inequality. What are the sources of the inequality? Okay, of course, it has something got to do with finance capitalism. So inequality and the rise of nationalism is the first dialectic. The second one, I will go into further detail, is the emergence of an involutionary mode of living since late 2010 and the filtering of empire at the moment, the China-US tension or the China-US imperial rivalry. Let me deal with the first dialectic, dialectic one, inequality and the rise of nationalism since 2008 financial crisis. Well, China, like anywhere else, during the stage of 2008 financial crisis, is adopting quantitative easing. The quantitative easing, okay, in order to boost those growth rate. So what happened is, okay, it was via a 4 trillion Roman B stimulus package. And the question is, the credit that are available from this stimulus package, subnational government units each seize their chance to win approval for their pet, for their pet infrastructural project. In other words, there's money there. So, okay, I'm going to put forward, okay, a proposal for a dam. This other local government put forward bridges. The other one put forward highway music hall, et cetera, et cetera. So this package, if you like, has intensified a land, property, and infrastructural mode of accumulation, which work in the following way. Let me go into it very quickly. To gain the funding, Local authority have to provide matching funding. In other words, okay, central government give you one third, you have to find the other two third. Okay, so how, where do you find the other two third? You find the other two third by intensifying the use of land. Okay, the use of land, China, given that it claims to be socialist, cannot sell land. So what do you do? So you sell land use rights. Not only you sell land use, right? You use this land use, right? Coupon, real estate, okay? Turn them into real estate, turn them into infrastructure, and in turn, use them as collateral. To use them as collateral to borrow more, okay? To borrow more, okay? Because of their relationship, okay? With state owned bank, they can get it at a very low interest rate. So these commodification of land, property, and infrastructure project has triggered financial tendency or crisis tendency, financial crisis tendency, such as rising land and property speculation, rising property and rent prices. Okay, I'm going to read the numbers. Rising local government debt because, okay, local government has to pay for two thirds. Where do you get your money? You borrow. So, not only that, land grab and land appropriation, infrastructural overproduction empty building, highway that leads to nowhere, et cetera, et cetera. All these are property-related bubble. And I won't go into, I haven't got the time to go into the stock exchange bubble. But anyway, so as I said here, okay, these, of course, with all these rising rent, et cetera, et cetera, it is increasing inequality. It's not just simply, okay, people are richer. At the same time, see, people are poorer. People are poorer because there's increasing inequality, okay? and rising social unrest related to undercompensation of land or property seizure, corruption, inflation, rising rent and low quality shelter, especially in first and second tier city, shrinking pool of migrant labor, high overtime and labor strike or unrest, pollution from factory and waste plants. 
of course, okay, with these sort of inequality, okay, et cetera, et cetera, okay, you know, arising, there are increasing social unrest. And of course, social unrest, legitimacy crisis. Legitimacy crisis of the authoritarian one-party state take step. Of course, the government would take step. They have to do something, okay, especially to that authoritarian one-party state. You can't base on election, okay, to gain the next round of performance. Sorry, the next round of, if you like, a legitimacy. So what do you do? So take step, okay, to gain legitimacy via demonstration of performance. The so-called, in Chinese research, performance legitimacy. Performance legitimacy, okay, in, involve a mixed use of policy instrument at different conjunctures, okay? Use of heightened economic growth, okay? The hype of GDPism, look at us, we are 8% growth rate, okay? But see how it's been calculated. We, we use consumer citizenship, okay? Citizenship is not based on vote. Citizenship is based on consumerism, okay? And of course, okay, for a while, they can do that. But increasingly, it's getting more and more difficult, especially with okay, economic downturn. Okay? And not only using policy instruments such as heightened economic rules, using nationalism, okay, patriotism, defend national interest, the so-called wolf warrior okay, type of foreign policy, and of course, increase in sub-hegemonic international influence. Okay, the sub-hegemonic building one belt, one road, okay, which I will quickly talk about later. So with all this legitimacy crisis, with the stepping up of legitimacy crisis, the authoritarian party state is mixing the use of legitimacy tools such as not only economic growth then, but at the same time, nationalism, especially in difficult economic time. Okay, we see it in other parts of the world, nationalism. So the claim that IMO, the claim that IMO sees is that there is an unbroken attraction of the Northern IMO need to be reconsidered in relation to the dialectics of global national changes such as the national might have legitimacy crisis, okay, rise of nationalism, and on the global level, even US-China tension, the tech war, the currency war, et cetera, et cetera. So the IMO imaginary is increasingly interlaced with nationalist narrative and practices of living in a more, sorry, living a modern commodity build lifestyle without entering or surrendering to imperial brand, without entirely surrendering to imperial brand, such as McDonald, Carrefour, HMS, Starbucks, iPhone, etc., etc. Developing and promoting China's own national brand, Huawei, Alibaba, Xiaomi, okay, the, the little the phone, okay, the China version of iPhone and brand nationalism under the so-called made in China drive. So China at the same time beginning, okay, to see itself, not only the West hype about it as being the big market, the big market, it itself see itself as being a collective consumer entity that can build harmony, harmonious society, because in the midst of a of legitimacy crisis, okay, you have to come up with other imaginary, harmonious society is one of them. So that can build hum harmony and growth under its internal consumption circuit. So in other words, what I'm trying to say is this dialectic of nationalism and even national, sorry, this dialectics of nationalism and even political consumption have rendered the IMO less attractive, let alone hegemony. Dialectics too. The dialectics too is the emergence of involutionary, involutionary mode of living, a little I now, okay, not a big I mode, the little I mode, the little I mode in China. Gai Ling, Gai Ling, you realize that you still have the two minutes. is fully diffused into the everyday material life of the middle and working class. Need, need to examine the material precondition. In other words, is the I mode that easy? Okay, is it expensive to have IMO? All right. Do the working class and middle class have to compete, self-exploit, overwork, debt-ridden 
in order to okay be able to meet the IMO. Okay, it is especially difficult when it is economic recession. Okay, with the economic recession, there's increasing struggle in middle class and working class in their working and home life. Overtime work 996, a life of mortgage slave, car slave, high debt, wolf mum, tiger mum, <laughs> tiger mum, chicken baby, cram school, poor health among middle classes. Especially for the working class, they begin to see themselves as hopeless subaltern subject. Okay, to use a Gramscian term, I've written on that. And a life of no car, no house, no bride. So the question is, in face of such excessive competition, high debt, burn, burnout, frustration and alienation, people in China, especially on the social media, is beginning to talk about involution since 2020. The involution, a feeling of being exploited, tired and overdrawn, okay, overdrawn and oneself, okay, want to alter the intensity of competition. In other words, deceleration, slow down. Even talk about lay flatism, okay, by lay flatism, it means the six no. No house, no car, no bride, no children, no consumption. If you lay flat, capitalism cannot exploit you anymore. So this lay flat, Lay flat movement, lay flatism. This is, if you like, the second dialectic. It becomes a space of doubt, an emerging space of doubt, a life of little I more, workless work and consumeless consumption. Okay? And this is, okay, the second, if you like, if I may speed it up a bit. And that is the third dialectic now. And that is filtering empire. Apart from the rise of nationalism and the involutionary mode of living, the continual crisis tendency of overproduction, social unrest, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, it's using another means, another performance legitimation tool now, and that is China is sub hegemonic actor. It is filtering its empire through the One Belt One Road project. The project obviously has its origin in the overproduction in China. And of course, okay, it's now talking about infrastructural project. And I'm sorry you can't see the map because of my picture there. But anyway, this infrastructural project, okay, is stretching from Asia to Europe and Africa. Okay, selling, of course, China's overproduction abroad. And of course, okay, since 2001, it's got its own tension and contradiction, okay, because you are stretching a global, okay, mode of accumulation. So, oversee land and resource grab, okay, extractism, China style, debt, debt capture, high fossil fuel emission, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. These plus US China tension plus the COVID crisis. The China leadership is rebranding, rebranding this project by imagining a green silk road. Not only a green silk road, but a digital health spin. In other words, because of the COVID crisis, it's combining green health, okay, and all these things rehash. And this rehash, okay, is there a possible emergence of a global regime based on if you like, okay, green digital product and green financial capital, such as solar, wind, tidal energy, electric vehicle, lithium battery, eco city, green AI and green bonds. So the question now becomes, is there an emerging China-led green health empire based on a one-party authoritarian push of global capitalist accumulation since mid 2000s. Okay? It's the emerging of this China led green health empire. Is this a dialectical imperial rivalry with the US center one? The US is already through the latest G7 okay, meeting, talk about clean green initiative, especially after the COVID. Is this going to be a competition in greenwashing, green grabbing, green standard step, sorry, green standard setting and green financing? 
What next for the IMO under such imper and sorry, what make what next for the IMO under such okay dialectical imperial rivalry? What is the source of imperial if neocolonialism doesn't only come from the historical north? If I got the time, I hope. You have one minute. Sorry? One minute. One minute. Oh, one, okay. minute. Oh, one minute then. <laughs> I might take two. So, concluding remark. First set of concluding remark. Theoretical issue. Using metaphor such as aspiration, attraction, and diffusion, okay, to map north-south relationship, echo more the Weberian modernization approach and Marxist-inspired approach. One needs to open the black box of hegemonization and, sub and subjectivization processes. Second set of conclusion, the dialectical entanglement between North and South, it's not just North-South, and in between, semi-periphery. Is there a central, is there a centralization of semi-periphery going on? The dialectical entanglement between North and South in the hegemonization and subjectivization processes. For China, this paper highlights three dialectical issues. The dialectics of nationalism and political consumption make the externalization of IMO less attractive, less hegemonic. The involutionary mode of living is dialectically intertwined with the imperial mode of living in the understanding of the complex hegemonic process. The dialectical imperial rivalry since the COVID crisis, especially when there is possibly a China-centered climate empire and a US-centered one. This is obviously implication for what constitute the imperial in the midst of neocolonialism that is not only coming from the north. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Gai Ling. Uh, this is, I think, is also a very important contribution. Uh, we continue with Sabrina Fernandez. Um, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, uh, thanks for having me. Uh, I don't have a PowerPoint presentation. Um, like I kind of got on board uh, last minute, so it was a little bit complicated for me. But thanks for for Uli for including me in the conversation. So I've been doing part of my work right now is trying to understand a few patterns related to ecological transition. And it's interesting how when we're talking about the global south. Uh, we run into issues related to the imperial mode of living, uh, both uh, when we're dealing with transition in the north, but also the delays in the discussion around transition in the south, right? So the majority of my research is very much focused on Latin America, primarily Brazil, a little bit of Bolivia uh, and uh, Venezuela as well. But uh, some of the things that we have identified, for example, is that, yes, as was mentioned before, I believe by, by, by Nora, that new extractivism is one of the main issues still that we're dealing with. Uh, and it needs to be understood as something that falls across all spectrums. So whenever there's a discussion, for example, uh, related to, yes, there's a, some sort of rivalry and competing interest, interests between workers from the North and workers from the South. This is also connected to how many communities in the South are continuously being exploited due to this demand for certain resources. And right now, for example, looking to the situation of Brazil where we have a far right government in power that has a very open anti-ecological stance. So for example, in the Bolsonaro government, there's absolutely no intention of hiding it under green capitalism or sustainable development or things like that. It's just very openly anti-ecological, very into the disregard for all environmental concerns in general. And this has definitely a, a, the entrance of more operations in the field. So we have, for example, mining 
companies uh, from Canada and other places are much more comfortable now lobbying for uh, extracting resources such as iron ore or gold from protected indigenous territory. At this moment right now, there are indigenous communities in Brazil uh, fighting to make sure that they will still have a, a right, an eventual right to territorial settlement. Uh, and the Supreme Court is supposedly voting on it right now to say whether indigenous communities will have a right just for being indigenous communities or if they have to prove that they were within that territory uh, in 1988 when the new Brazilian constitution came into effect, which is really absurd because we're talking about almost 500, year, 500 years of continuous displacement. So obviously the majority of what's left of the indigenous communities uh, in Brazil, which nowadays is less than a million people actually, um, they wouldn't be located in all of their territory because the territory was stolen. So this is one of the challenges right now, but what strikes us as very depressing, very pessimistic, is even though we are dealing with such an anti-ecological government, the left uh, only brings up these issues, the more hegemonic left only brings up these issues uh, around environmental protections, for example, in a very limited sense, in a way as to make opposition to the far right government and all of those setbacks. But whenever we're trying to push, so I come from like a tradition of very like um, uh, scholar activism, so very much engaged with a lot of the initiatives in Latin America around this, um, there even the most socialist left refuses to acknowledge the need to talk about a, an alternative to the developmental paradigm right now, or there's also this idea, and this is why I think the conversation about imperialism in general is very important uh, here, but this idea that if we are talking about ecological transition, if we're focusing on climate change, fighting climate change as a priority, that's a way of getting, uh, creating obstacles to the development of Latin American countries. It's a way of furthering the interests of imperialists. At the same time, they're part of this left promotes uh, the notion of an imperial mode of living. So we would see that, for example, a more moderate left, and in the book, um, William Marcus talk, talk about this, the idea of like uh, inclusion through consumption. This is still very much the paradigm. Uh, the people are not really willing to let go of that. We will see some variants here, for example, in the most moderate left, uh, it's getting access to credit, is making sure that people can purchase things. Whereas on a socialist left uh, would it be, well, the state will provide some of these things as well. So there's a little bit, bit more of the equilibrium, but whenever you dare discuss anything close to degrowth or some limits to the participation in the fossil fuel industry, in the extractive industry in general, um, they treat it as if it's a way of actually furthering these imperialist interests from the North uh, to the point that some of the conversation around um, more environmentally friendly candidates around the continent is sometimes framed by the socialist left as well. There we have someone who's co-opted by the US because then we're not going to be sovereign in terms of exploiting our own resources and they're going to get to grab it. When, on the other hand, what we're dealing with right now is actually a new wave of green extractivism. This is very uh, obvious when we're talking about lithium, right? So when we're talking uh, about part of uh, Chile, part of Argentina, and also Bolivia, even though the lithium in Bolivia, there's a lot of hype around this because of the, the coup uh, that was supported by the, um, the OAS. And there's a lot of conversations when Morales talked about the lithium and Elon Musk, Musk said that we will coup whoever we want and things like that. But the lithium in Bolivia is not that kind of prime lithium yet. It is lithium that's harder to extract. It's very much under um, a protected area right now. So the, gover the government has, um, even though it's back to a progressive government, they have a harder time with this. But in Chile and Argentina, it's definitely an issue and also the exploitation of rare earth minerals. So much that Bolsonaro was elected in Brazil talking about uh, the availability of rare earth minerals in Brazil uh, as a way of uh, strengthening relationships with all countries and So most of the time it's an issue of whether we're going to have 
um, capitalist development in the more neoliberal sense, or we're going to exploit all of those resources, but it's going to be through the state. The discussion about alternative alternatives is getting lost. And when it gets lost, it also means that we're missing out in some conversations about climate transition that are very important and should be discussing reparations and also a better distribution of resources that are placed in Latin America. So not only nature continues to be reduced only to free gifts of nature, these resources that can be exploited, but there's also a situation where, for example, uh, the Green New Deal discussions in the United States, the European Green Deal uh, discussions as well, and in other parts of the world where the imperial mode of living is more of a reality. Um, it's very common that you would hear people talking about uh, this climate transition only through technological means. So it is about transitioning from one mode of uh, energy production to a different mode, more renewable mode of energy production, but without actually capping the demand without actually uh, making more structural changes in society so that people won't use it as much. And why is it important to talk about that? Because, well, these minerals are in fact limited. And we're not talking just about rare earth minerals here. We're talking about minerals in general because extractivism is a system uh, that uh, deals with the destruction of communities and biomes, even when it's going just business as usual, when we're not talking about the big disasters or the big um, ecocidal situations. So it means that uh, if these minerals are being ex extracted to aid in the transition in the global north, and they're, they're used in the sense that, well, we don't need to actually fix anything else because we are going to be producing enough energy and electricity is a, primary, is a primary concern here. We're going to be producing enough of it that we don't actually have to adjust anything. It also means that we're dealing with, with the situation here that this is going to be a loss for countries that not only need to transition themselves, but also need to catch up in terms of basic basic standards of quality of living. Because when we're talking about the Global South, the discussion um, around matters such as degrowth and even consumption, it gets complicated. And Uli mentioned earlier, right, that there was this criticism that the book uh, brought in this discussion about consumption. And we know that the left tends to be very uh, uncomfortable with this discussion. And just because it's uncomfortable, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't be doing it. And obviously it makes it much harder to discuss it uh, when we are in the global south, when we're dealing with uh, basic, basic matters of um, of standard of living. Uh, so that makes it complicated, for example, when a huge part of the, the, the communities don't have access to proper water, sanit water sanitation or part of the country is not connected to the energy matrix. And uh, so obviously we're dealing with this and we know that this is not where the critique around consumption or the critique around degrowth should fall on, but there is a tendency that whenever we're talking about uh, changing some values, reorganizing society, moving, for example, to um, care democracy approach where it's going to be more about how we rearrange services, and use values rather this idea of you know getting more and more things and consuming more more things and looking more like for example the American way of life. Um, there's a tendency for leadership in the left to distort this uh, to actually block the conversation around extractivism to make sure that it keeps going on uh, um, as usual. Some advancements that I've seen in this discussion is that. Whenever we're dealing with the far right and such an anti-ecological approach, and of course, that's not the only way that the far right operates, right? We also know of the stances of eco-fascism, of territory appropriation, anti-immigrant uh, anti policies and things like that. And there are notable examples of this uh, in Europe and the United States. But the far right in Latin America is much more prone to uh, go towards complete environmental destruction rather than eco-fascism. But uh, what I see in this sense is that this is also creating very hard com complications for the workers in the global south, even the, in the extractive industries. Because for a while, we've seen things that, for example, the field of renewables uh, is usually being led by private investment. So that means worse 
risks, they're not as stable, and things like that. So when engineers, for example, go to the university and they're working in the field of energy, uh, energy production, they would like to go towards extractivism because there you have a bigger presence of the, the public sector, you have more regulations, you have stronger trade unions, and in that sense, you feel like you're going to get a better job out of that. However, the situation with the far right and uh, privatize, privatizations everywhere and this idea that we just need to give away all of our resources as cheaply as possible to service capital, international capital primarily, it means that even these jobs in the public sector, they're becoming more precarious over time. And this has created a window of responsibility to engage with discussions with these workers in these labor unions. So for example, some of our discussions with uh, the, the workers organizing the major trade union in Petrobras, the Brazilian uh, oil company, uh, they've been talking about actually returning to previous investments of turning the company actually uh, in a national energy company and not just a company around fossil fuels, uh, because they feel like the research that was being uh, put forward there, even though it was still marginal around renewables, right now it's being done away with and their situation is much more precarious. So perhaps transition is actually a way of saving their jobs, even if it means changing their jobs into something else. And um, it's actually quite interesting that uh, in June, for example, we were having a conversation around this and then I said, well, so are we talking about um, uh, an abolition uh, Petrobras in the Marxist dialectical sense that, well, it changes, it, it's overcome, it becomes obsolete, and it turns into something else. Uh, so, you know, the abolition of Petrobras, it means the foundation of a solar browser and so, something like that. So they decided to start implementing this in part of their discourse and see that, well, as a trade union, we're going to have certain responsibilities here, because we know that just being a public company is not going to give us the answers for this. So there are a few fields that perhaps five years ago would not be interested at all in talking about um, challenging notions of development and challenging notions of energy production and extractivism. And because the precarity is so high right now, they're having to be created and they're having to, to listen a lot more. So we're moving right now from a uh, trade union that just a year or so ago talked about, well, we can't let Bolsonaro privatize Petrobras and use our pre-salt layers of oil uh, because the pre-salt layer means a hundred years of energy sovereignty for us if it's used publicly. And now they're acknowledging that makes no sense that you're going to say 100 years of sovereignty because we're dealing with climate change now. It's not something for the future. It's not something that we can just postpone. So there, there are a few places where we're trying to, we're trying to bring back this kind of convergence, convergence, but it's a fact that the notion of an imperial mode of living is still very much present in the leftist imaginary. It is used as a way of comp competing with the right uh, saying that, well, we are about abundance, uh, but it's real abundance. But then whenever they bring the symbols of it and uh, the narratives, it's not actually about subverting it and talking so much about other ways of living well, even though there's a more marginal left that talks, for example, about when we veer good living and things like that. That's still very much marginal. The hegemonic left is still uh, very much willing to partner up uh, with the national bourgeoisie. Uh, or with international capital, where is the hegemonic socialist left? That's not that big uh, at all, but it's still kind of locked into this old imaginary of what it means to develop. And develop means to have more and more industrialization and hard industry, just like it was before, because that's the only way of achieving sovereignty. Sometimes when we're in these discussions, I try to bring the example that, well, um, we got to a point in Brazil that we had landlines, like phone landlines, uh, but they weren't widespread. Not everyone had access to a landline. So when cell phones arrived as a technology, what did we do? Did we wait and then made, made sure that everyone had landlines and then introduced cell phones? Or we kind of just understood that landlines were becoming more, more obsolete and we changed our infrastructure towards um,
trains that right now actually should be taking advantage of these gaps. There is enough technology that would allow us to do so that we don't have to go through this stage-based approach to development to finally get to the green side of it because we might not have enough resources for it. And this current way of doing things is very much aligned with what far-right governments want in their very anti-ecological approach. Uh, in that in this situation, it means that uh, in discussion the, discussing the imperial mode of living in uh, the global south, it means also bringing it closer to some of these discussions around peripheries. So like St Stefan talked a little bit about this, but for example, uh, one of the challenges that I've encountered here in a more theoretical uh, challenge, but it, this also translates into political dealings, is that the socialist left in Latin America is very much tied to the development of the critique of the Marxist dependency theory, talking about the center of capitalism, the periphery of capitalism, and how we would have in the global south a system of depend dependent capitalism that keeps us in a situation of underdevelopment. So this is part, this is part of what we face. But for me, it has always um, been quite odd how Marxist dependency theory refuses to deal with ecolog ecological concerns. So we could, you could go into a section of library that's dealing with, with Marxist dependency theory, and uh, you would have a hard time finding discussions around nature, ecology, or even environmental protections. It is as if those were not part of the conversation. And part of it is that the notion of nature as free gifts that goes back to like Marx discussing this in the in the volume theory of capital is still very much present in the basis of this theory. Once we remove this, there's actually a lot of room for us to find good dialogue because if we talk about an equal ecological exchange, you will find parallel patterns of an equal economic exchange. So how this transfer of um, nutrients, this, this tra transfer of uh, biological material, this tra transfer of raw materials to other places is very much tied to the same patterns of the super, super over exploitation of labor in the global south. Because to ensure that you extract these free gifts of nature, you will also have to make sure that the labor involved is also as cheaply as possible. So this is part of the conversation that I would like to see more uh, around uh, the discussions of dependence, but Sabrina, usually it falls can, short, yes. Can you come to a conclusion? Yes, so okay. uh, so around this, I think that uh, one of the things that we can start working around is uh, making sure that whenever we identify the certain, certain places where people are understanding that the crisis today is already uh, the biggest obstacle to having a better life, it makes it easier to criticize how these notions of consumption and these notions of what it means to live well that are definitely being imported from capitalism uh, make this kind of critique. But going back to the notion of like popular movements and finding these very strategic trade unions here and there, because at the party level, the situation is still quite complicated, and this is faced like in the majority in the majority of the countries in the region. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Sabrina. Well, we had three very interesting contributions, I think, for the discussion. And so now we can start with exchanging views and criticisms, questions. Is there anybody who would like to say something? Mm -hmm. hmm? What? Nora? Nora? I don't see Nora with that. Ah. Nora. Nora? Ik zie ook geen Nora. Okay, I, ah, Nora. Have, I have to always wait a bit until I can unmute my I'm still until I am unmuted and until my okay, okay. goes on because I cannot do that myself. Um, I thought that those were very, very, really three very exciting contributions and I would have so many questions, but I will reduce myself to one or two questions for each. So the first question for Stefan, uh, just about the table that you showed about trade relations. Can you uh, elaborate a little bit on that and say what is counted 
you know, because as much uh, what 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 are the things that go into this trade processes? Because as Marcel said in the beginning, you know, um, in order to have a product, the product goes to very different countries uh, until it maybe enters, let's say, a European country as a finished product. So do they also count uh, the resources, the half products, so on and so forth? You, you got my question. Yeah. Um, and then um, I have a question to um, Guy Ling. Um, I very, very much appreciate uh, the three dialectics, you know, and opening this black box. But the question is also, if you connect um, the brands and the new technology and the new way of life with national brands, is that such a big difference to, I mean, is there such a big difference to wanting a Huawei phone as opposed to wanting an iPhone? So is there not a close relation between what is seen in parts of the global north as a good life and what is seen in China as a good life? And, um, and the question connected to that is, who are those people with the laying flat and involutionary mode of life? To what class do they belong? You know, how strong are they and how do they relate to this? Brand nationalism. And uh, finally, to Sabrina, thank you very much for that. And um, my question is you, you talk very much about the socialist left and the workers, mainly in the industrialized production, uh, which is very important. But um, how do they relate, for instance, to the movement of landless peasants? to the pe uh, feminist peasants movements and so on, who have another concept of well-being. I mean, you, you said there is this other concept and it's marginal, but um, talking to some trade unionists in Brazil, I also got the impression that there is a certain pressure from these movements towards the traditional industrialized trade unionists to take up the question of the is that the case or what was that just an impression that I had? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, if it's okay with the three uh, introductory speakers, uh, we continue with collecting a few more questions. Is that okay? Yeah. So Uli is next. Uh, yeah, also from my side, um, this was really great. I'm, I'm fascinated. I just want to, um, I have also to, to um, each um, um, person, colleague, um, one or two points and questions. Um, I just want to, um, against the background of Stefan's um, um, uh, thoughts, to remind us, because Marcel, you said um, in the previous session, the imperial mode of living is a theory. No, it's not a theory. It's a heuristic. It's a conceptual proposal. And we, I learned in this session particularly that um, it needs to be kind of... Um, not only implemented, but rethought in very concrete uh, historical context. I think Anna Preiser is also um, um, present here as a, um, um, as a participant, and she's co-editing a special issue of a journal in Austria, the Journal für Entwicklungspolitik, on the improvement of living. And there we had some conversations with colleagues from Latin America. And there, in these conversations, I learned how to translate the concept into very specific uh, context and um, Stefan, you gave us a very um, a lot of food for thought. How to um, uh, how to think it for very concrete studies when you talk about the specific position of countries in the in the world system. And also, what I would like to underline um, after Stefan's and Sabrina's um, uh, intervention, maybe for tomorrow, um, what models of emancipation we refer to. And Sabrina was quite convincing, showing, and she's also an activist, an activist scholar, that the, the traditional left is trying to deepen the imperial mode of living. And what does it mean for emancipatory struggle? What is the very meaning of emancipa emancipation about? And Stefan, you also referred to this. Then the point, um, I, mean, very, I thank you very much. I already wrote to you uh, before when I uh, read your PowerPoint. Um, the aspirational issue, this is quite quite important, interesting. 
I would argue um, we don't reinvent modernization theory. We, we want to refer to Gramsci uh, uh, and Marx, but of course, um, um, a weakness of our approach is that we don't look concretely into the whole hegemonization and subjectivation, but I, I would um, defend uh, our approach to say we offer the, the, the tools or the conceptual framework to do this. And then people like Sabrina in Brazil, a colleague now from Bolivia, Mario de Rodriguez, he is kind of um, um, studying how the imperial mode of living is um, kind of um, implemented or processed within Bolivia. And you gave also very, very exciting examples about China. So um, in our book, the sixth chapter is about imperial automobility. And there we argue against our background in Europe, how this hegemonization and subjectivation works. Yeah, we try, really try to show it because this is our background, it's Germany and Western Europe, but we are kind of um, dependent and we hope that others in other world uh, regions uh, open the black box as you as you insist we need to open the black box but uh, uh, again i would say this is not that we refer only to um uh, to parsons or to to uh, modernization theory but we are still on in, in line with Gramsci and um uh, and um and marx but we need to recontextualize this was my my first um uh, uh, remark um, and maybe the last um, and the rest. You, you, the, the, your presentation was was very interesting. The, the the national brands that it's not a universalization; it's really a recontextualization. I found this very very interesting, and also the the concept of involution of in, um, involutionary IMO. And my last remark is on Sabrina also very much, and also that you stepped in um, at, at such a short notice. I'm very happy that you are present here. Um, I already commented uh, that we should really look at this development, developmentalist left, and this is a major challenge how to counter this, how to look, uh, Nora already said it, at more concrete struggles. But my, one point is very important for our future research. And many of you know that Markus and I, we go now for some time to Rosa Luxemburg Foundation to Berlin and to, to do this research. What is green extractivism about? What is the other side of the, co of the coin? And I think that the IMO, uh, IMOL um, gives us many um, um, conceptual tools to, to rethink the other side of the coin, to really bring together the experiences in China. We are not, we, we, we are not, um, we don't know very well what is going on in China. You are right, um, Nai Ling, we, we use old literature, but I work a little bit on Latin America and, and, and Sabrina gave us the examples. And I think this is so important for critical research um, to link it and not to to um, to um, kind of hide the other side of the coin when now even within the radical left comes to a critique of the European Green Deal, of the Green Deals. Um, I just um, uh, um, discussed with Bernd Rixinger, the former um, head of the left party in Germany, and he concedes also that his very radical program for a, a, a radical Green Deal just... Um, 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 doesn't think about the global south, doesn't think about the other coin uh, uh, of, of the process. And I think we should, we should insist that this needs to be done. Thank you very much. Thank you, Uli. And then we have Markus. I hope, yeah. Yeah, also many thanks from my side. This was extremely inspiring. I made a lot of notes when I listened to your presentations. And I think it's a lot of theoretical and empirical uh, stuff for us to think about and to uh, consider it in our future work. So um, I think particularly there's the challenge to, to look precisely what is happening in individual regions, where are differences, where are similarities. So um, I would have, let's say, uh, some comments or questions on, on what has been said by, by you. Um, the um, point of Guy Ling with the diffusion aspiration, I think this is very important. Yeah. We got a similar critique by Stefanie Hürtgen, a German scholar who uh, works on labor relations and industrial relations. And she also said that the term diffusion is very misleading and indeed. It is more, yeah, let's say, from a modernization theoretical position, which we 
do not belong to. So we should have thought about uh, using this term. And I think it is not so much about diffusion, but more about, um, let's say, a generalization via the mechanism of capitalist competition on a world scale. I think this is what is happening. Yeah? And um, if we use this terms and see it from this side, then I think we can indeed um, leave such misleading terms like diffusion um, and yeah, um, make clear the theoretical tradition we uh, see ourselves inside. This is one point. Um, another point is and here I would like to take up the comment by Nora. Uh, Galing, you, you talked about the situation of the working class, the middle class in China, and you described this as an involutionary mode of living. My question, my, my impression was, is it so different from what is happening in the global north? And because the phenomena you described are also quite familiar in the global north. You know, the overworking, the burnout, and uh, and a lot of problems that have been aggravated by uh, financialized neoliberalism. You know? So are there not so uh, also commonalities between what is happening in the global north and the global south? And the last point, the question is, what would result from this? I think um, here I would have a question to all three of you, because Stefan talked about the, the class structure. We should have a closer look at class structures. Yeah? Um, Guy Ling talked about the resistance, about the involutionary mode of living. Sabrina talked about possible yeah, links between the trade unions and other social movements um, that have emerged more recently. I would be interesting in what what do you think? Is there a certain possibility of aligning, of overcoming the, the, the impasse of the traditional left um, of um, that have, have that have been highlighted by Sabrina more recently? Are there attempts, are there approaches to between to to align or to overcome the difference between trade unions and social movements that struggle, for example, for let's say a care democracy, for an eco-socialism, for an use value orientation, for a completely different form of organizing the economy and the society. From your experiences in different contexts, can one observe such tendencies and what would be the preconditions to make them stronger? Okay, thank you, uh, Marcus. And then we have Hermann Peterson. Hello? Hello. Hello. You have raised your hand. Yeah. Yeah? Um, yes. Uh, wait. I'll put the video on. No, it's the question and answer uh, uh, sector. Yeah? Um, there's a question by Rodrigo Fernandez. Competing hegemonic imaginaries projecting, wait, projecting different imperial modes of living are ultimately based on a clash of modes of regulating capital accumulation. Are we seeing a return of an imperialism as the highest stage of capitalism type of tendency propelled by the imperial clash between China and the US? Or is there an overarching structural feature in the current stage of capitalism that transcends imperial rivalries? For instance, can the financial real estate complex embedded in the mode of regulation in both China and US be a mediating, pacifying force? Well, not a difficult question. So, um, I uh, would now like to give the floor to Stefan first. All right, I, I will try to respond uh, briefly. And um, also include, if, if possible, include uh, the last question. Yeah, I, uh, yeah. Would I would uh, love to do that. Um, firstly, Nora's question on what is measured, of course, what is measured are prices and uh, measured is like value in a certain sense. Um, and we all know um, that uh, if one reads Marx, uh, uh, has read Marx, uh, that of course uh, the exploitative 
moment, the value of which has been captured in a certain way profits, um, they, they are certainly missing in this calculation. And if you would pay workers who uh, have produced the goods um, with higher wages, and if you would uh, uh, maybe pay uh, yeah, a lot of things for the, uh, the ecological, environmental damage done, the uh, prices would go up, but I think it's um, it's a little bit. I just wanted to come to a debate, which which has been also been like quite present in Marxism, Bob Sweezy debate. So where is the wealth of nations <laughs> coming from? So is it mainly coming from uh, colonial, neo-colonial, post-colonial extraction? How important is it, um, or is it coming from productivity gains? here in the EU. So I think this, this is just a question which should be kept in mind when we are talking about these global exploitative structures. Uh, the China-US question. So I'm a little bit involved because I'm currently heading, we just started a project called the Clash of Capitalisms. So um, as um, there's a lot of investment now flowing or used to be quite some investment flowing from China to Europe, and we're going to these plants which have been taken over, doing some field studies, looking at the, um, uh, the uh, also the political level. I think um, there's a big difference to, to the uh, Lenin higher stage um, period. Um, which is quite simple. Um, well, capitalism is much more transnationalized in a certain way. And there are nuclear bombs, so military conflict is working in a different way as we've seen all these Cold War logics. But I think there will be a conflict and there is already a conflict. Um, huge question, which will be, uh, which role Europe will be pl uh, playing in it. So um, if it's leading closely to the US or how it will be related, but there's something like, it's mainly an economic warfare, one could say, and a techno nationalism emerging. So it's uh, on a different level, this conflict as it has been up to now um, in, in the times of, of the early 20th century. And I think we have to rethink it a little bit. What does that mean? Some sort of conflict between emerging and emerging however you call it, imperialist center or whatever, um, uh, in such a new transnational uh, global um, formation. So I, I won't, no, I will stop here. I could say something on all these remarks, but I think um, we can do that if you want. You can do that if you want, Stefan, if you want to say something on all these remarks. I, Later, later, maybe Let, let's. Okay, well, we would have had time for that. To, so well, then let's. Maybe next person can. Let's quickly move on to Nguyen. Mm. You had uh, several questions, yes. You are mute. Can you hear me now? Yes, now I can hear okay, you. Thank okay, thank you. Yeah, sorry. Uh, thank you, Laura, for your questions. Okay, and first of all, and it is uh, it's the China brand. Okay, you know, either you use you know iPhone or you use Xiaomi. Okay, you know, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Is it as imperial? Now, the issue for me is is okay. I do not I do not reduce things to the imperial for a start. Secondly is, even if it is imperial, this is a struggle between imperial. And if it is a struggle imperial, at the end of the day, and that is, who gets the unequal exchange? Who, 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 who's cheaper in this unequal exchange, et cetera, et cetera. So in other words, okay, one has to open up things. Okay, that's what I'm trying to say. Okay, open up things. And the question in addition to it is, okay, imperial. This is exactly my, the last bit of my, 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 my presentation. And that is, where do we locate the imperial now? 
No, in the midst of this neo-colonialism, okay, coming from China, especially from the One Belt, One Road, okay, where do we locate it? Okay, you know, the so-called, you know, imperial mode of living, okay? This is exactly, you know, what I'm trying to raise the, the question. And not just simply, okay, reduce it to easy kind of, okay, unequal exchange. Who's going to get more from this unequal exchange if there is now an imperial rivalry? Okay, will it be deepening? Okay, and this deepening, can it be overcome that easily? Somebody's reaction, okay, uh, I, I, I can't remember, I, I, I did not catch, catch the name, and that is, can, can there be something above it, okay, such as finance or, or, or something? Let me tell you, another struggle in the inter, inter, inter rivalry, imperial rivalry, is exactly on currency. On currency, and that is China at the moment is trying to get away from, okay, an international trade system that is based on the dollar, okay, and based on the dollar, China has already tested in many sites, okay, which, uh, which one has to do a bit more research on that, okay, and that is to use digital currency, digital currency denominated in the renminbi, China yuan. Okay, et cetera, et cetera. So the question is, this is not to simply easily reduce it to things, okay? I was just, all I'm saying is, to be perfectly honest, okay, is I want to open up things a bit more as opposed to, okay, you know, a sort of, if you like, okay, the usual unequal exchange. Yes, 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 we all know that, okay, you know, and uh, the, the, the usual imperial mode of living, IMO, okay, et cetera, et cetera, okay, which I think, okay, if one is not, is it one if it is not one is not okay that careful in opening up things a little bit more those black boxes okay it's easily you know sort of if you like okay get into you know a, a, a sort of easy research let me put it that way and um uh Oh, uh, back to Laura. Okay, because I, I think I've linked those two questions now. Back to Laura, and that is, uh, yes, the slave flatism. <laughs> yes, the slave flatism uh, is among the middle classes, but at the same time among the working class subaltern. The subaltern uh, working classes, especially the second generation working class, moving on to the third generation of migrant workers in China. Okay, you know, they are, they are talking about, okay, late flatism and even in some way, okay, you know, it's a movement it's a movement there now, okay, the issue is in China is actually at the moment, the authority is very, very careful, okay, in taking any opportunity, okay, in discrediting this lay flatism, okay, it's, you know, but, but I won't go into that, okay, so in other words, okay, this is at the same time answering Marcus' question, and that is, well, it's in Germany, okay, you know, people feel burnout, et cetera, et cetera, but is it a movement? Is it a movement, okay, that at the same time, okay, you know, where there is this second and third generation migrant workers, okay, you know, even moving on to the third generation, okay, near now China is suffering or undergoing, okay, a, a, a period of, you know, sort of labor shortage, okay, and third generation workers and third generation migrant workers, okay, is an important, if you like, okay, facet, okay, and, and China is taking every opportunity, okay, in discrediting this, this, this is so-called lay flatism, and lay flatism is at the same time in the middle class, in the middle class in the sense that, okay, the middle class, as I said, okay, you know, I mean, in this sort of economic downturn, all right, you know, with COVID, et cetera, et cetera, all right, you know, what 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 happened to the middle class? The middle class is it's not it's not exactly doing very well. Okay, you know, the middle class is at the same time, if you like, okay, undergoing, all right, you know, this sort of pressure in life, okay, the pressure in life, and middle class are rather sympathetic to this lay fetism. Okay, they echo at the moment, all right, but not. As a so-called, you know, even they're now turning it as a as term, terming it as a as a movement and chat, and the authority is reacting. Okay, if it is not something that's okay, you know, just I feel you feel, then okay, you know, no, 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 sort of if you like, okay, you know, um, uh, authority, okay, might turn the attention just yet. You know, just let it blow away, you know, sort of thing, okay, or you feel it, okay, et cetera, et cetera, okay, but not, well, 
this is a, a little bit more than, okay, you feel, I feel. Um, as opposed to, oh, I don't know, Uli. Yes, about this um, um, diffusion, modernization theory, et cetera, et cetera. I'm seeing there's a hint of, okay, modernization theory, with if one is not dealing it with enough care. All I'm talking about is enough care. So one has to, in order to get out of this possibility, okay, of being interpreted like this, I'm not the only one, okay, as um, you, Marcus, or oh, somebody has said, I can't remember now, okay, you know, that, you know, if one is not careful, okay, you know, it could, I mean, saying that the hint is there, like it or not, okay, then the question is, you refer to chapter six or whatever, okay, fine, all right, but I still say the same thing. I still say the same thing, and that is, okay, one has to open up this black box with more tools, with more conceptual tools. The conceptual tools, including, okay, in a quick question that I have laid down, okay, but I could go on, all right, you know, and that is the conceptual tool need to be, what are the ensemble of apparatuses? Okay, that are engaged in this so-called okay diffusion or you know the imaginary or promoting this imaginary or this IMO. Okay, what are the okay ensemble of apparatuses? What are the expertise here, organic intellectual that are involved? Okay, and what discursive technology are being used, okay? And one is into this sort of discursive technology, then one has to bring in a little bit of Foucault. It's not just simply you go subjectivity, therefore, okay? In between the jump, okay, from Gramsci to subjectivity, you need to have this object-subject relationship, okay? You need to have the object, construction of object, how object, okay, is getting into subjectivity. There's a long trip there, okay, which a lot of people in the so-called post Foucauldian world and at the same time, okay, people trying to, okay, work with Gramsci, Foucault, Marx, et cetera, et cetera, is exactly one of the things that they're trying to do. Okay, so, well, you know, I mean, it's your project, but I read your book and this is what I come up with. Thank you, uh, uh We have also a question from an anonymous uh, attendee for Sabrina. Maybe we can yeah, read that I, first before maybe we. Maybe to make it quicker, uh, I kind of read it already because I don't. Yes, but but not everybody read it. So if you wait for a second, yeah. Don Herman with his beautiful voice will read this. Ah, yes, that's a special. Uh, special aspect we haven't thought about yet. Yes. Um, the anonymous attendee says uh, something of a, both a remark and a question towards Mrs. Fernandez. Uh, your comments on the state of mainstream leftism in Brazil. There is an echo somewhere. Okay. I don't know where. Uh, Marcel, are you muted? Yeah, I'm yeah. Somebody else in the room not muted? Oh. Well, okay. Uh, we will try to continue. Um, ah, yes, I see. <laughs> no, our tech support has taken care of Marcel uh, already. That's why he was muted and before he wasn't. So now there's no echo left. Um, your comments on the state of mainstream leftism in Brazil are enlightening, but I'm not sure whether or not I misunderstood your grievance with the particular uh, dominant viewpoint being embraced by especially Marxists within Brazil. It's a problem that Marxists in Brazil are not engaging into discussion and contemplation as to how we can move towards sustainable development, or is the problem that they entertain the possibility of unsustainable development until they have reached a point of development that enables them to switch towards sustainable development relatively smoothly because of the relatively higher level of development in technological resources, it would 
be relatively easier for Western Europe to transition to our sustainable development, especially in the presence of centralized economic planning that undermines the anarchy of production inherent in the capitalism. Continued uh, second contribution. I'm not sure how this would be feasible in underdeveloped or maldeveloped countries that lack the technologies and level of infrastructure to switch towards sustainable development. So there being a brief stage of traditional industrialization and development might be permissive under early stage socialism. Well, but of course, the path towards sustainable development is one we must all deliberate on and take into account as opposed to simply thinking about having higher living standards, etc. That's it. Okay. Um, Sabrina, the floor is yours. Okay, I'll try to be succinct. I'm going to start with that one, actually. I think there's a, a huge misunderstanding usually around the discussion of development and underdevelopment that makes you think that uh, underdevelopment is a stage, uh, but it's actually a process. I would say that for sure, for example, countries that are very much located in this neo-extractivist belt have a lot of technology, uh, have the knowledge, have the research, have the resources, but those are not appropriated for its own development because it's part of the system of dependent capitalism. So under development in a way kind of operates as a myth to make sure that you cannot move beyond it. Uh, for example, Petrobras uh, through its uh, biofuel company actually holds one of the most advanced technologies in actual sustainable biofuels that don't have a huge carbon footprint uh, that can grow alongside food crops in an agroecological manner. It's like one of the most advanced things, but it's not in the interest in the current system to do it. And the traditional left is not interested in that kind of uh, scenario because it's more focused on traditional industrialization. And I think that's a problem with this stages approach. I don't use sustainable development. I believe that sustainable development is a capitalist paradigm. I'm, I talk about alternatives to development. And alternatives to development uh, require us to imagine other things as development rather than the same things as before. And that's why I think that this discussion around the automobile industry uh, that's in the book, I think that's quite important because we don't need to deal with the, the size of the population in Brazil. We don't need more cars. We don't need to put more uh, more automobile plants and make national national automobile uh, industry or something like that. We need a proper urban infrastructure. We need railroads. We need other types of things. So when we're talking about alternatives to development, is that actually about refusing the for formula of development that was imposed on us historically and denied to us because our resources were being taken somewhere else. And this is part of the problem with the Marxist imaginary uh, in a lot of the socialists left in Brazil is that it's all very radical in the sense that yes, let's expropriate the expropriators and let's end capitalism, but then let's still do things about the same way. This is a critique that goes back to, for example, it's Van Mezar who's talking about it, about how uh, the, these notions don't move beyond capital at all because they keep the same treatment of nature as free gifts. They say they keep the same uh, social metabolic um, crisis in that sense. So it is about actually moving on from that. And I think this connects a bit to what Nora was asking in terms of, for example, the feminist campesinos and the MSD is that this discussion in the past five to six years has really improved in those circles. Uh, so we need to understand, for example, that for uh, the majority of the time, the language workers movement in Brazil did not talk about agroecology. It was still uh, uh, locked into the green revolution paradigm, but with distribution of land. So uh, they understood that this is not going to work out this way and connected to other patterns. And sometimes even because of health concerns and things like that but they are not understood as key to development. And so that's the problem here. The paradigm of development is still very much locked into the notion of capitalist development in the global North and the, uh, produ the, the production of goods and services that fit into an imperial mode of living. And in that sense, it's all very good and dandy when they bring you the MST and they talk about organic crops and uh, all of these uh, uh, rural, rural uh, uh, advancements. But well, that's not actual industrialization, right? 
So uh, it's important for us to make this sort of connection, to make, make sure that we go back to the leftist se sectors that are usually perceived as key. Well, that type of industrialization is actually a waste of resources, uh, both in terms of research, available technology, and raw ma materials to actually just replicate the same way things were done before, since we actually have the opportunity to jump years uh, in, in terms of development. And obviously, if we're talking about the Marxist left here, we need to be talking about breaking patents, we need to be talking about climate reparations and climate debt, and all those things that will contribute so that these countries are considered under development, underdeveloped, don't have, need don't need to fall behind, and that's why this discussion of green extractivism is very interesting and very important right now because it's actually kind of just like passing under our, our noses, right? So the majority of green deal discussions are purely domestic. Is this, uh, it's as if the resources are coming from like out of the air. So the geopolitical and economic um, circumstances and transactions are being mostly ignored, even in the most radical leftist circles. And that creates a, a situation here that, for example, uh, there are some researchers in Argentina looking to the situation of the new European Union and Mercosur trade agreement and how that's actually a way of boosting the trade of certain resources that are going to be good for ecological transition here in Europe, but it means fewer resources for our own ecological transition in Latin America. And it's falling under the noses of a lot of people because, well, it doesn't, it doesn't seem that's that important yet. So uh, this is part of uh, the concerns that, I mean, like the critique of the left is really important here because there's still a lot of things that are normalized. And they're normalized because the left doesn't want to deal with the discussion around consumption, and it doesn't want to deal with the discussion of like changing values and the way we organize society. I mean, when we talk, for example, the fact that in Brazil right now, uh, the majority of kitchens, uh, they use, they utilize um, gas that comes from petroleum, right? And when we talk, well, it's very expensive right now because Petrobras is basically being privatized and people can't really afford. So people are trying to cook with other materials. They're getting burnt. And it's a huge crisis around that. So what we should, what we should have is a plan to actually electrify our kitchens. And Brazil is actually, actually why positioned in that sense because the patterns of sustainable development already created a huge mess with a huge uh, hydro, uh, hydro dam infrastructure. So we could do that. But there are people on the left who are like, well, well, but I don't like cooking that way. So there's still a lot of um, pettiness involved in the discussion because it's not actually about alternatives to development as it should be. It's still very much focused on this idea that we can just reconcile these notions, right? So, and then just in terms of like the preconditions, I think there's some room, Marcus, here for making sure that, for example, when Petrobras uh, made this huge advancement in like agroecological biofuels, which is the a tiny, tiny, tiny little piece of the biofuel discussion because the majority is actually very dirty. We're talking about like soy monocrops and things like that. What, what did they do? They connected to the Campesino movement to make sure that uh, at least a certain percentage of you know mamona crops and babasu crops will come from agroecological campesino movements. So this economic connection creates a lot more resilience than at the dis discussion level with the parties right now. But obviously this means that at some point we need to reach it in that way. And maybe to close it off, just a point on like what Rodrigo's question is that I don't think there's like a return of imperialism because imperialism has always been there. What we think it, there's a return of imperial polarization in the sense that there's like these campist approaches that are usually quite damaging in the sense that you will get people defending everything the Chinese government is doing because they're enemies of the United States. And if the United States is the big bad guy in the situation, well, well, the enemy of my enemy is my friend and I can't criticize them. So this is uh, sort of dumbing down the conversation a lot, is reproducing a process that we've seen like back in the Cold War. And it's actually a bit disheartening for me to see that even like in ecological Marxist circles, everyone just kind of decided to call this a new Cold War and go back to this polarization, not looking, for example, that 
uh, the Chinese state is responsible for imperialism in Latin America and in the African con continent. And you don't even have to look into political dealings to analyze that. You just go back to look into ecological imperialism and the transfer of raw materials very cheaply. And the Chinese government is saying that's okay because we didn't break any laws. But obviously, because the laws weren't very good to begin with in those places, right? So it's created. does not to help us actually with the bottom line of an alternative to development and actually moving moving from this way of pr producing things and consuming things. Thank you so much, Sabrina. I think this is a very good conclusion for today's uh, discussions. And uh, the only thing I can say now is we reconvene tomorrow at 10.15 and we hope to see you all back again. Have a nice evening. Ciao. Thank you, Marcel. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.